So I'm very excited to introduce you to all these folks, but I'm going to give you just a little bit of orientation. Is there anybody here who's brand new to the Institute of Noetic Sciences? All right, quite a few. All right, great. And is there anyone here for whom, including you guys, uh, this is your first Institute of Noetic Sciences conference? Wow. All right, well, welcome, you guys. Okay, so our founder was Edgar Mitchell, Apollo 14 astronaut at six person. So Edgar grew up in Artesia, New Mexico, very near Roswell, make of that what you will. Um, he was obsessed with planes and flying from a very early age, obsessed with space, and as soon as he heard as a Navy, as a Navy pilot that there was any possibility of an opportunity to go into space, he was the first one to raise his hand and sign up. He was immediately accepted partially because he was an amazing pilot and partially because he was brilliant. He was an engineer trained at MIT. You still talk to the remaining Apollo astronauts and they'll say, you know, Ed was the smartest one of all of us. I heard one of the guys say, uh, they said, you know, why did you pick Ed to go with you? You know, he's got these interesting beliefs. He said, I didn't pick him to go with me, I picked him to get me home. <laughs> So you got to also imagine these guys in Apollo were sitting on top of like tons of rocket fuel in a little tiny what amounts to tin foil capsule to be catapulted off the planet with less computing power in the entire Apollo program than the computing power in your smartphone in your pocket right now. Okay? So these were some brave dudes. They made it. Thank goodness. This is the lander named Antares. I um, would like to let you know that Edgar's granddaughter Antares is here this weekend. And tomorrow night she will be presenting a, a clip from a documentary that she's made about Edgar's life. And so I really welcome you to that. Um, so this is Ed um, on the moon. They collected a lot of moon rocks. It was the most scientific mission to date. They did a lot of work. These are actually pictures from Ed's camera when it has the little um, crosses that he gave to me before he died. Um, and so all of that was amazing, but it was really his trip back to Earth that changed his life more than anything else had. As some of you in the room know, you know, on Ed's return to Earth, he was done with his work. He was lucky enough to have the window seat, as he puts it. There he was in the space capsule, rotating slowly, seeing the sun, the earth, the stars, and the moon, the sun, the earth, the stars, and the moon. And he was overcome with a profound, deep epiphany that completely washed over his mind and body. He felt like the molecules of his body were one with the space capsule and everything he was seeing. He saw order and divinity. Well, actually, let me have him tell you. and the earth from this distance, observing the passing of the heavens as we were rotated, I saw the earth, the sun, the moon, and a 360 degree panorama of the heavens. The magnificence of all of this, what this triggered in my visioning, in the ancient Sanskrit, is called samadhi. It means that you see things with your senses the way they are, but you experience them viscerally and internally as a unity and a oneness accompanied by ecstasy. All 
matter in our universe is created in star systems. And so the matter of my body and the matter of the spacecraft and the matter of my partner's bodies was the product of stars. We are stardust. And we're all one in that sense. in my in the back of my eyes and throat and a lot of joy because over the time since Edgar came back in 1971 and founded the Institute of Noetic Sciences in 1973 it's been this incredible journey and what part of what his vision was dedicated to was the understanding that that knowledge that he received directly in the space capsule through this epiphany which he would have termed spiritual spiritual epiphany was as valid and as useful to humanity as the rocks that he brought back as his footsteps on the moon. Both together. And that's where I think we need to go in society is really understanding that the inner world, those experiences, that kind of knowledge, noetic wisdom is as important to the future of humanity, if not more, than the technological and scientific discoveries we make without saying that those should go away. Those are amazing too. We've got to hold them both together. So we're up against a little bit of a challenge, which is that about 400 years ago, to solve a big problem where the priests and the religions were basically suppressing any kind of scientific observation, Descartes came in and said, hey, how about if we just make the natural world for the scientists and the inner world for religion? This was actually a really good idea because it let scientists start to do autopsies and make actual observations without getting burned at the stake and things like that. So that was good. He said, okay, just let's, science will be natural world, um, spirit will be religion. Um, unfortunately, I think it was putting Descartes before the horse. <laughs> So science has these explanations for how things work. You know, the mind comes from the brain. Uh, religion says it comes from spirit. It's, you know, there's different ideas about where we come from. This is Adam and Eve, uh, or evolution. This is a guy saying, for the last time, stop following me, I'm a creationist. <laughs> but what we're beginning to find now is that some of the discoveries that have been made through spirituality throughout the centuries, throughout the millennia, are starting to converge with the findings from science today. And some of that convergence, which our friends at SAND call OM equals MC squared, <laughs> are that we are actually interconnected in a very real way, that everything is made of energy, that time in some ways is an illusion, that there's actually no real solid self, we're a flow of information and energy and replacing ourselves all the time and that things like love, kindness, and compassion are good for you. So we're going to start there as a starting place to say we are coming into this with the idea that if astrophysicists, astrobiologists, space explorers can communicate with spiritual wisdom and clergy and spiritual teachers, that we may be able to solve problems that are facing us and understand more about who we are and the nature of reality than we would if we keep them separate. So now I would like to introduce our first guest. One second. Well, Brian, my introduction of you is going to be very informal because my iPhone decided to go crazy on me, but maybe that's just how it's supposed to be. So Brian Keating is an astrophysicist who is at University of California, San Diego. And what I know about Brian is that he is building telescopes that take up about a third of this room and that can see further into space or further into the past, same thing, as any telescope that has ever been created in the history of humanity. He takes them down to Chile, we can look 
further out into the universe. Um, he was very close to winning the Nobel Prize, so close, in fact, that he wrote a book called Losing the Nobel Prize, <laughs> which is not actually sour grapes. It's his uh, viewpoint on the idea that the competitiveness and the focus on achievement and acquisition in science actually may hold us back and take us to some dark places. So it's my pleasure to introduce Brian Keating.